Great. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Where Are We Now, which is the first event of Shifting Tides, which is a digital festival exploring the intersection between art and climate activism. Uh, my name is Hugh. I'm a member of the Almeida's Young Producers Programme. Um, and in just a moment, I'm going to be asking all our panellists to um, introduce themselves. But just a couple of bit, quick bits of um, housekeeping first. So this event is being live captioned and you can turn these on by pressing the closed caption button at the bottom of the screen. Um, today's event is a panel discussion, as you can see, which is going to be about an hour. And during the last sort of 20 minutes or so, I'll be opening up to questions from the audience. So please do submit any questions you might have using the Q&A button. And if you could do that in sort of the first 40 minutes of the, um, of the panel, um, that'd be great, just so we can organise all the questions and have them ready. Um, so today our panellists are Days Agaji, Charlene Gandhi, Noga Levy Rappaport and Louis the Sixth. Um, so guys, if I could just ask each of you to introduce yourselves and um, sort of say who you are, what you do and how you're involved in climate activism. So uh, Days, if you could go first, that'd be amazing. Hi, um, I'm Days. I'm a 20 year old climate activist. Um, I would say my work mostly revolves around campaigning and setting up protests. Um, currently, the UK's re UK Ex Extinction Rebellion Youth Regenerative Culture Coordinator, uh, all in mouthful. <laughs> um, but I also do uh, work outside of that, working with NGOs about how they can start thinking about the environment in a very different way. Um, and also um, working with Belgrave Trust, uh, which is a small uh, founding um, like funding foundation that is currently working on how we can radically fund youth. Um, so interesting to be from both sides, both the activist but also the funder. Um, so yeah, I think that mostly covers a lot of the work that I do, um, but I'm so happy to be here amongst such amazing people. Amazing, thank you. Um, Charlene, if you could go as well, thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Charlene Gandhi, and I'm a freelance climate and business journalist. Um, and within that, I sort of focus largely on um, the business of food, um, agriculture, land, um, the role of race and class in climate activism, um, and also how we can better support small and micro businesses all over the world um, to, to better sort of um, become acquainted with the climate crisis and become ready um, for when when the climate crisis becomes a real problem. Um, and aside, aside from that, I'm also um, a champion at the Pentland Centre for Sustainability and Business at Lancaster University. So again, working at that intersection between climate and the world of business. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, Noga, if you want to go. Thank you. Hi, I'm Noga. I'm an 18 year old climate activist and organiser of the UK Climate Strikes. Um, kind of working not just to organise the strikes here but also to coordinate the new kind of Friday to Future movement on an international scale. Um, I also work in schools on developing a new system around which we can not only decolonise education but introduce um, the climate crisis from kind of the early stages right until um, really the end of year 13 and then on into further education. Um, I also am a member of the advisory board at the National Lottery for the new Climate Action and Community Fund, um, which is really centered around ensuring that um, local groups can, can not only challenge themselves to, to reshape kind of the sustainable initiatives that they're working on, but also um, encourage communities to kind of take steps that otherwise they wouldn't be able to afford um, in, in kind of redirecting what green spaces can look like and how uh, we can really respond to the climate crisis as as a community. Um, I also run a local community theatre um, that I've been running for the last four years, which is really around um, youth enfranchisement. And for me, that's something that I think really propelled me into climate activism, particularly amongst kind of young people and, and how we can enfranchise ourselves. Amazing. Thank you. Um, and Louis, take it away. Hi, um, my name's Louis V.I. Um, I'm a musician and composer. Um, a lot of my music does kind of involve a lot of talks around the kind of climate crisis problem, but um, I'm also someone that studied zoology and on the other side also make films like most recently a film aimed at young people of colour in, in the UK to try and get them to vote in the last election based on 
climate issues and kind of bring people of color into the conversation that's been predominantly led by white people and it's quite a white uh, kind of facing conversation. So I'm trying to change that narrative. Um, and yeah, kind of everything in between, to be honest. Um, yeah. Cool, brilliant. Thanks everyone. Um, so for today, I've sort of thought that in this first 40 minutes, if we can sort of go through some kind of narrative and structure, sort of a where are we now, um, but where do we want to go and sort of how do we get there as well. So I thought I'd open it up with just a question to everyone um, and sort of hear all your different perspectives on this, um, which would be sort of in the context of everything that's happening at the moment, the pandemic, um, how has it affected the climate movement in terms of activism and campaigning and perhaps sort of even your own personal engagement um, compared to where you were at maybe before lockdown? So anyone far away? <laughs> I can kick off. Um, so I suppose thinking about the intersection between um, the pandemic and the climate crisis, I think we've seen so much good um, press around how actually we've been propelled into a position where we are able to see that we don't need a lot of the luxuries that have led us to a very to being a very emissions heavy society and that's particularly in the west um so you know a lot of fantastic press on um you know the the fact that we just basically aren't flying anymore and how we have essentially found new ways to define success and define happiness and i think sometimes when we think about the climate crisis we don't think about some of those more philosophical concepts that have led to um, us forming the societies from an anthropological perspective that we that we live in today so i think from that perspective it's been um fantastic um, my slight pessimism, of course, comes from the fact that we haven't been able to organise as much and we haven't all been able to get into the same spaces as much. Um, and I think what the pandemic has really exposed us to is some of the deep social and socioeconomic factions in society that mean that, um, you know, people of colour and those of working class backgrounds are, you know, not only more impacted by the health crisis, but also more so by the climate crisis. Um, and something that um, I think summarizes this perfectly and summarizes the link between health and the environment perfectly is the fact that air pollution as a cause of higher risk of covid in communities of color was completely eradicated from the government report um, and i think those of us in communities of color knew full well that living in these environments living in these environments where um, you're more exposed to air pollution you're more exposed to industrial waste has inherently led to a large scale respiratory problem amongst communities of colour. So that I think has been a really interesting um, balance. And I think we've really seen that actually the environment and health aren't two crises that exist um, separately. They do, you know, they're, they're both sides of the same coin. Thank you. Does anyone else have any sort of, any, any other thoughts on sort of like, I guess, thinking about that kind of, again, that context in the pandemic about the the issues themselves like do we do we need to see these issues get especially given everything else has been happening in the pandemic sort of black lives matter and the racial justice movement like gaining momentum and things are these the kind of issues that like we need to be considering always together like are they sort of interconnected racial justice social justice environmental justice um if anyone has any thoughts on that yeah i feel um charlene brought up a really good point about covid and i feel for me it's it's understanding like the vulnerability in our society i feel like prior to covid19 when we would say the system is broken people won't understand but after seeing the injustice that's happened throughout this but the government just clearly not caring for us in the way that they should be um that this shows that we need to take this into our own hands and i do feel like especially black lives matter being like the first ones to rumble onto this and, and get the point of like we need to do something about this um, and it's making people shift in consciousness like and I feel like this is just the beginning because when we all start going back to some sort of normal people start working ridiculous hours and start remembering the time that they were at home working and spending time with their families their kids um, and having that connectivity towards their community as well and they they will long for it and that's when people realize like what a precious time this is to make change yeah I, yeah. I, I think I think, um, sorry to just jump in, I feel, I feel like 
uh, like I agree with what both Days and Charlene were saying. I think COVID, you know, our government described it as the great leveler, but it wasn't at all. It's much more like the great mirror. And it's shown so much and so and so frankly the inequality in our society is not just like here in the UK but around the world and also like what it you know the the possibility of what it could look like it living in a greener and more sustainable economy and how that's intrinsically linked you know like communities of color do like Charlene was saying live happen to live in areas because of like government inequality like created inequality they live in areas where there's higher levels of air pollution and people are going to look back on this time and remember the skies being clearer hearing birds for the first time people getting happiness um from things as as simple and like overlooked before as as walking in nature or going to the park it's been you know one of the, the main things people miss when they're trapped indoors um and i and i think you know this great mirror of covid as has shown that the overarching umbrella of all of this is climate change and Black Lives Matter, social inequality, like uh, gender equality, all these things fall within um, climate change because climate change is something that doesn't, isn't just a recent phenomenon. It kind of all begins with the degradation, um, the exploitation of land from the beginning of like colonial times. Um, and I, and I think it's something that we have to look at historically as humans and how our approach and what our kind of social contract is with nature and with, with each other, I think. I think absolutely during COVID, like we've, we've had this microcosm kind of moment of looking at the systems around us and saying we are totally unprepared we, we are totally exposed we are easily battered we are completely unprotected um you know and and there has been nothing really there has been nothing i think for me almost special about this pandemic in the sense that there was no leveling out of equality there was no government support that was surprising or different in the sense that you know, you go into any great crises and you know who's going to suffer. Those who are most vulnerable, those who are most marginalised will suffer. And, and the climate crisis is built on exactly that. And for the last 40 years, as kind of um, it started hitting around particularly the global south, we, we, we've seen exactly that happen. And we know that um, both globally and nationally, we are, we are not prepared to be hit by this, this kind of catastrophe, really. And... I think for climate strikes in particular, it was an opportunity to redefine the ways in which we organize, particularly digitally, and redefine the way in which we can empower young people and communities and networks around us, but also talk about what a green recovery plan can actually look like and how we can come out of like the coronavirus crisis and say, okay, how do we, how, you know, how do we build back better in the sense that how do we totally redirect public investment how do we look at the different groups and demographics that are most affected by the climate crisis and recognize the patterns that we see in other you know political disasters like the coronavirus and how do we ensure that um, we can massively reduce these kind of social and economic inequalities and target investment in communities where it's most needed how do we ensure that we can you know, see a green economy emerge that can operate equitably? How can we actually, you know, protect and restore kind of the, the habitats that are being threatened, the carbon sinks that are threatened and and look at the green spaces around us, look at the cycle lanes that, that are opening up and say, okay, how do we make this the new normal? How do we make this permanent? It's really interesting that you, you sort of like, you're touching a bit on sort of, this is a very global issue, like this is happening everywhere. Um, I know, for, for example, Louis, like you're a second generation Dominican, like these issues happening across the world and often in more severe parts of the world, especially in the global south, things like that. I was just wondering, like, in terms of issues, especially issues which can be close to home for a lot of people, but not a lot of people necessarily in the UK, how do we get people to try and empathise and engage with issues that are happening on the other side of the planet that they might not be, they themselves being feeling the immediate effects of? I think education is really the first 
the first step and I think a really good example of where this has happened over the course of the last couple of months is in the fast fashion space and there's been some fantastic online activism showcasing the extent to which fast fashion corporations are exploiting those um, primarily in Bangladesh but other South Asian countries um, who work in garment production factories and again it's a crisis that's crisis that doesn't sit separate from the climate crisis you know the fast fashion industry as a whole contributes more to the climate crisis than aviation i mean does that not blow your mind that we feel this horrible need to just acquire 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 at such a pace that we have completely forgotten where all of that comes from and i think it comes back again to what what all four of us have touched on and this idea of connection and community and we very often forget we are so far removed because we just exist as part of a supply chain and we're sort of largely the end of that supply chain especially those of us who sit in in western countries we have almost completely forgotten you know all the steps in that supply chain and that there are actual people involved um, and mo more often than not those people particularly right at the beginning of the supply chains are those who are hit hardest financially by by changes made on the other end you know whether it's cutting prices um, whether it's you know diminishing stock or whether it's uh, you know Nestle for example deciding that it doesn't want to to partake in fair trade anymore because that is an additional financial cost to them but what does that mean for the people on the ground and the agricultural communities on the ground who are very reliant on these supply chains existing um, and that's something that we just don't think about so I think education and in particular actually um, whilst we haven't been able to meet um, in person during the last three or four months what has been fantastic I think is the extent to which online activism has really taken off and I think Instagram has become more and more of a platform where you know if you surround yourself with the right accounts and if you surround yourself with the right um, content there is a lot of education happening on that platform and I think um, you know young people are really sort of pushing the boat out there in terms of putting out not only educational but also very consumable content and I think sometimes the climate crisis conversation the climate activism conversation is sort of very full of jargon um, and that I think has been a really positive shift in the last couple of months is actually we're saying look there are a lot of people who are apathetic and that's okay because not everybody has the time to engage with this and it is a privilege to be able to have these conversations in the first place but how do we communicate in a way that is familiar? You know, how do we make this human? Um, and I think that that sort of human centric communication and education is, is really, really important to bring it back to to realising that it's not a robotic supply chain. I guess it's really interesting that you're talking about sort of almost the way that activism seems to have changed even more in lockdown towards something that's digital. But sort of thinking even before lockdown, like I guess, um, like Noga and Days, both of you, like, have talked a lot um, in the stuff you've done about sort of this being a very youth-driven movement. Like, is is it like because it feels like it might be a youth-driven movement? Are these kind of platforms like the tools to to use it? Do you think digital sort of um, outreach using social media is the future of all of these movements, um, especially if it's a yeah something that's driven by youth? <laughs> you go first <laughs> I definitely think that um, I think you know connectivity was was mentioned earlier and I think that is the most important thing that social media has to offer and that's you know how things can blow up that fast the immediate shares and the clicks and within seconds you know you can you can reach people who would have likely never interacted or engaged with that kind of content before um, just because it's on a page they follow that might not regularly put out that kind of content. Um, and I think subconsciously so much more is taken in than, than we realize. And you can, people are consuming so much more almost like activist, like infographics and content than, than they otherwise would. And I think that was, that was particularly clear during um, the kind of the, as, as Black Lives Matter protests were sparking off, this was very, very obvious. You know, you were able to kind of reach people about upcoming protests in a way that like just wasn't imaginable before. But even before lockdown, what was particularly striking for me about social media is, is also that it is this like endless archive. When you're looking to inspire people, when you're looking to prove to people that taking to the streets works when you're looking to, to say, okay, action is crucial. This is what has happened before. This is what can happen again. You can pull up anything within seconds. You can pull up these videos of protests from a year ago, from 10 years ago, you know, articles from 20 years ago, Facebook posts from five years ago about 
politicians showing their true colors. And this, I think, is, is what makes it so powerful. And, and it, is that, it is that nature of it as this, this massive, massive archive of proof that what we are trying to do can and has to work of you know statements and and publications from particularly indigenous activists um across the global south that don't have that many platforms that are able to just be massively massively amplified um by creators across the global north and in the west in particular and that is something that you can pull up at any point and that's something you can share and i think without kind of living in the digital age we would particularly for Fridays for Future, I think we wouldn't have grown as in with the kind of exponential speed that we did. We wouldn't have reached from, you know, one teenager to hundreds to millions within, you know, the space of, of a year and a half. It just wouldn't have happened. Um, and for young people in particular, our, the energy that we have is translated so easily into you know into digital spaces because it's what we've grown up with it's what we understand it's a whole other language that we all speak fluently and i think because of that we're able to to connect and to pull each other forward and to push each other forward really and progress in that way yeah i definitely agree with you i think um especially like for me when it comes to social media it's more of this like weird interconnectedness where like there's so many of my activist friends I've never met in real life but I knew them through zoom I know them through instagram and you create these bubbles of understanding in these communities and I think that's like really important especially when it comes to young people having the space to express all of the emotions that are related to the climate express that grief express that you know that want for life express that um like the creativity that we have and it's been really amazing to watch people create things um, and and like create new ways to connect to nature because I think that's another thing like when um, uh, Charlene was talking it, it, like it really resonated with me that a lot of the time we don't have ways to actually spot the climate crisis like I grew up in Lincolnshire and I thought flooding just happened every year I was like you know it was totally it was just like oh this is just it just happens right um, I didn't even realize it was connected to this greater thing and it was only when I came to London where like um air pollution personally affected me where i became really really ill and i wondered what was going on the doctors said oh it's just probably hormones that you just can't breathe maybe puberty not realizing that i was living next to an incinerator that was burning 24 hours in areas that are mostly predominant ethnic minorities and it's that kind of injustice and that like lack of understanding of what the climate is and what nature is and how like we are one player in this really really big game um and and I think that's where we have to see it holistically. Like the way I would describe the climate crisis is that it's almost like a it's a this is a byproduct of our toxic system. We've learned how to abuse people from colonialism to sexism to um, work exploitation, and we are just taking that same attitude that we've learned how to do again and again and again to the earth. But instead, the earth's basically saying we don't actually need you um, and we'll kick you off because it's not the earth that's dying, it's the earth becoming inhabitable for us, you know, and I think that's something that we really need to remember. It's really interesting you say sort of like, again, this issue, it, it, it always seems to come back to the fact, like you're saying, it's very holistic, like it's very multifaceted. There's so many different elements to it. So just sort of thinking more now, I guess, more about like, where do we want to, to go with it? I was wondering like, what, to any of you, like, what do you see as the ultimate goal for the climate movement? Like, it because it's such a multifaceted issue. What does success look like when it comes to the climate crisis? I, I think, like, to slightly play devil's advocate as well on the last point. So apologies to everyone because those are all good points about social media. But I think, um, yeah, slightly playing the devil's advocate. I think social media has a really strong purpose and it's especially like Charlene was saying on an education basis and able to galvanize especially the younger generations but is there a glass ceiling where a lot of that you, in that stress or that need to express a need for change is almost satisfied by just remaining on social media and then not going out into the world and actually creating things like you know um extinction rebellion did where it's organized disruption which forces a conversation now like there's lots of different ways of making change and making things happen 
Um, and it's a difficult one because historically, you know, leaders of change we've seen have been assassinated and leaders of movements have been, you know, infiltrated. So maybe this is one that's a far more decentralized movement that's much harder to break up. And that's probably where I feel a lot of the, the, the positive change will happen. Um, and a lot of the stuff we see our governments doing is like a reaction and as a, a symptom, as a reaction to being able to un like to prevent or stop or like DC, a far more like decentralized revolution. But I think we really need to look at what we want the end goal to look like. So like, so responding more directly to your question, if we want the end goal to be to live um, as humans that are far more like stewards of our environment, of the, of the natural world, where, you know, technology has enabled us to be sustainable, we have net zero, which is what, which is also, you know, and I think a lot of the jargon around, Charlene again was saying this, a lot of the jargon around climate change issues is problematic because a lot of people don't even know what net zero means, including governments. So it's like, okay, mate, what is our actual aim? Are we, you know, this net zero idea, or are we trying to become societies that consume less as well as like have those technologies that mean we produce energy in a sustainable fashion for me i think the future looks like something that goes quite a lot along with the green new deal uk and in the us um and i think it's a combination of moving a, a little bit away from individualism it's a it's a, a philosophical change as well as like a societal change where people start to realize, you know, there's a collective responsibility. So things that you do, do affect other people. And right now, especially in the West, it's a far more individual, individualistic, God, I couldn't even say that word, individualistic way of operating. Um, and then if you combine that with um, a lot of the technologies that are already available, where you create energy from passive means like solar energy, or more active means that are sustainable, like hydro um, or geothermal. I, I, I think that's when we start to see a more interesting world. And it's one of those ones, it's like, this is happening, whether we like it or not. And it's about changing maybe the approach from being like fighting climate change and it being like uh, an overly like maybe like masculinized word to fight climate change maybe it's something that needs to be made to be far more part of our everyday life and a bit more playful i don't know like like those seed bombs and that people put kids playing game with them and stuff i think i think it needs to move a little bit more in that way um but yeah sorry that was a really long answer that's all right um but i was just sort of thinking from that as well we're talking a lot about not only individualism and collectivism and big organizations and individuals, um, but also talking about energy and thinking about development as well. Like I know Charlene, you, you do a lot of stuff talking about and working with businesses on, on like development and consultancy, and also thinking about, I guess, development in different parts of the world as well. So I guess I've got a, a question I would kind of want to ask. It's, it's, it was sort of, you know, some people criticize environmental regulation to, in suggesting that in developing nations, there's more of a trade-off between sustainability and economic prosperity, like what do you think are the biggest challenges in creating sustainable development and how do we overcome them? Do you know what? I love that you've asked me this because I was literally writing an article about this last night and I'm like, oh God, that's my ending sentence. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I won't steal that off you. Um, but I think what we need to do in, in response to that question where we are constantly, especially in developing countries, we seem to be weighing off um, sustainable development with economic prosperity is firstly, what does sustainable development mean for these nations? And I think actually in and of itself, that term sometimes means everything and nothing. And these nations are in a place where obviously 
you know, from years of colonization, from years of sort of systematic oppression and, and stripping of resources, stripping of agricultural land, um, stripping of Aboriginal rights in so many countries to feed the West essentially um, in a near colonialist fashion has continued. And that's meant that these countries are continuing to be on the back foot. And I think um, that's where our responsibility as a developed nation comes in. And I think what we need to do more and more is actually analyse deeply where our foreign investments are going. So I think divestment from fossil fuels is 100% something that we need to do. And you know, there's plenty of activism going on in that space. I think the next step to that is really looking, you know, where, where is the UK investing in, you know, in, in international countries and why is it investing there? Um, you know, a really good example of this is um, in Australia at the minute. Um, they are shipping coal over to India um, for the coal to then be processed there and then set the power from that coal is then used in Bangladesh. So the folks in Bangladesh are essentially picking up the, the money that, that the Australians and the Indians are making from processing and mining that coal. And obviously, needless to say, in that situation, the folks in the Bangladeshi community are the least well off and you know if we continue to propel this myth that actually um, not investing in in renewable um, energy sources in these countries is going to mean that they aren't able to uh, economically prosper as quickly cool okay they might be able to prosper for like five ten countries but what happens after that when we run out of fossil fuels so if we start that conversation now and if we as western economies are able to take that responsibility and really analyze you know where are these investments going um i think that that is a really in, important thing that is often you know shrouded because it's just something that's so foreign to us um, and we don't necessarily analyze those international relations very much um but you know australia is not the only example you know a lot of um developed countries that have historically had interest in fossil fuels are still continuing to exercise those interests just in novel ways you know in neo-colonialist sorry neo-colonialist ways where they are able to continue to gain financially from building power plants you know in 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 less developed areas so um i think that is something that we we really need to continue to do on a business front and just to add to that as well um we, we need to hold big business accountable. We really do. Because I think a lot of the time, the responsibility gets pushed onto us as consumers. And I think a really interesting dialogue there is, for example, when Primark opened up and there was a lot of sort of demonization of folks going and shopping in Primark. But if there is a system whereby that is the only affordable option, you can't demonize those consumers because then, you know, they can't afford what is labeled as sustainable fashion. So we need to hold businesses accountable. We need to push that risk back onto them and we need to be begin to sort of make them take responsibility for those negative externalities because at the moment they're pushing them onto us as individuals. And the other thing I'll add to that, sorry, last point, is that organisations are made of people. Organisations are not like these big monster robots. And I think sometimes there's like this dichotomy between the two where it's like, oh, we the consumers exist here and we the, the organisations exist here. You know, we work, we buy from things, we buy from places, um, we interact with brands. So organisations are people. So the change does start from people, but it's seeing yourself as part of a system i think that is really important like thinking about that as well like on talking about the larger scale sort of systems and the way that i guess like capitalism and stuff works within it like i know no Grand days as well in particular you, you guys have have talked a lot about sort of we need radical change like we need radical systemic change and i guess just thinking about in your roles as as influential people do you feel that if that's something that you you need to fight for is it about just presenting the information to people unfiltered or is it about you know do we need to actually actively try and shape people's opinions that disagree with us to make that change happen yeah it, for me because i i come at this a very different different angle i think for me i think the work has to start with the person and not in like an individual individualistic manner but is in like a way to one realize like what role do you play within this society and remembering like i like how especially in activist circles it's like oh the system there society's there i'm just kind of like out of it and it's like no you're not you're still here you're present you interact with these power dynamics every single day and you need to know what part you play in this you need to see where the part that you play may be problematic and you need to correct that 
and it starts with this like really radical like inner work and this purging of this toxic system that we've all been socialized in you know so it's also like having some empathy upon yourself because like everyone is kind of an oppressor in some way um me everyone included <laughs> um so I, I think it starts on that really like personal journey of getting there learning how to work with one another learning how to be a part of your community in, in a healthy way um and then that's kind of like you're taking like a really like self i think it, it does boil down to this like real radical self-development where you have to learn like how can i be the one to push forward this solution you know and i feel like that's a journey for everyone to take and if everyone does do that that's how we get that really really big change as you were saying like you know within companies because i know like xr is like one of those where it's like you have the big evil giant xr who's racist and horrible but then you actually have the people and they're seen as like two different things um but once we start kind of like breaking down that okay like that's their public perception they're evil they're horrible and actually start having that conversation of seeing the people and seeing what they're holding and what we can like work like collaboratively together to change that's when we'll start getting things really happening and i do think it does start from like learning how to be part of this society and learning how to be better within ourselves and learning how to express that outwards and i think that kind of comes back to your original question about what i what change do i hope to see in the future i hope this radical inner work is will just be happening everywhere. And Black Lives Matter has really started that off. I've seen lots of people educating themselves about anti-racism. And that's only one part of this massive uh, isms <laughs> that we need to like break down. Um, so that that's kind of where I see this going. And through that, through a way of learning how to be part of the society, learning how to care, learning how to have like tr true empathy, that's how we're gonna change everything. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think for me as a young person, it's it's so much about the empathy and it's also about like our actual education system. Um, like I, you know, obviously surely you touch on like big businesses and like the people behind there. Like I, you know, I haven't had a job yet. I've just turned 18. So like for me, a lot of it is about um, transforming our education system into a totally different radical decolonized space where we can actually learn about the roots of the ecological emergency, its colonial roots really, about its solutions, about the Green New Deal, but also about kind of why why these ideas are here and how they've come about and the history of, of campaigning against climate change, the history of our political systems. Because I think for me, I, the enfranchisement of young people can't come without this, this reform to our educational system. There really is only so much that digital spaces can do. And it, it has to start from such a young age. We have to you know break free of what is ultimately a very restrictive national curriculum and that i think for, for forces us to to concentrate on this very limited range of subjects rather than actually allowing us to develop our understanding of the world around us to develop our understanding of connectivity and of um of globalism and of, of international networks and i think we we are massive it, our, our right as students to view the educational framework as a place of opportunity and development and understanding is massively encroached on by kind of the, the way it's currently structured. And I think uh, a result of that, possibly, you know, intentional over time, has been that we aren't encouraged to step out into the streets. We aren't encouraged to self-organize. We really aren't encouraged to look at kind of the injustices of the world around us. And we can only really do so when we're taught in full about not just the climate crisis, but how to respond to political disasters, how to enfranchise ourselves and the people around us, how to work for rather than against our future and, you know, grasp these kind of crises in depth. And I think that has to, it's, it's quite hard because before the last election, I, I probably would have come at this with a more optimistic outlook, but obviously at least for the next five years, there's, there's, a fairly limited amount that we can expect kind of from the top down so this has to come from and i think most campaigners would say that this is the best way regardless but it has to come from local communities it has to come from the grassroots that we have to organize this bottom up and not only implement no local initiatives but ensure that that collectively students and teachers receive this kind of adequate funding, economic support to engage each other with new ways of thinking and organize, to be able to reorganize um, 
the way we're taught about the impacts of climate change, about its roots and the action we can take. You know, I think for me in particular, like young people are the home of grassroots activism. I think that you, that kind of the, the hopelessness that is so prevalent in campaigning is only really defeated by kind of the innocent optimism that you can only really find amongst young people. You can only really find amongst people that are constantly um, kind of regenerating the, the feeling of a movement that are constantly ready to kind of rise up and, and, and fight back. And I think particularly with like, well, not even particularly with any single social justice movement, young people at the forefront of it again and again. And I think there is so much that we deserve that we haven't got yet there is so there are so many doors that we have to push open in order to actually understand and then take action um about what's happening in the world around us that i think it, it's it's a it's a requirement of whatever comes next that we totally totally redefine how we learn and educate and engage with each other amazing um just thinking as well sorry as just to quickly mention, well, we're going to be taking questions in or doing the questions in just a couple of minutes from, from our audience. So if anyone has any questions in a couple of minutes, we're going to start going through all of them. I just wanted to ask one more, um, kind of like we're talking there a bit about a, a lot about sort of education and I guess educate, education is where it starts, especially for children and stuff. But I guess the, my other kind of question is that the problem is also now and it like a lot of it feels like we need to be educating and informing adults and to nicely segue into sort of what this festival is kind of about like art and culture so anything that people digitally consume like film tv music like do we feel that that is an important vehicle for for educating people i mean like to, to sort of ask you louis like in your in your like music and your role as, as an influential person do you feel that climate change is an important part of your message and your work as an artist yeah, definitely. I think, <clears throat> I mean, it's such a complex issue. It requires like a great deal of imagination to be able to imagine kind of solving it. So all that, you know, the, all the arts and those ways of communicating are all about imagining something that doesn't yet exist around you, kind of thinking about the possibilities. And I think drawing from that is 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 really important and, and I think you know you're completely right because time is definitely not our friend at the moment so we both have to educate you know the future people the young people and the adults at the same time and I think one of the things that we really need to educate on top of everything um, everyone's been saying which I totally agree with is humans relation to nature as well and us not seeing nature as something that has a value to us in a sense of a monetary figure but has a value to us as something else that's like another fellow living thing so it becomes far more a question of like morality like for example if you look at the fires that happen in well i mean multiple fires that happen across australia or across the arctic circle the amazon if you have kids that have been taught differently about humans' relation to nature and it's, they see this as far more a tree, not as something that can be cut down and turned into wood to be used as a material, but a tree is like a living entity. It doesn't just become like a sad thing to see this natural environment burning, but it becomes also a moral thing to just seeing living things burning. So I think there's a lot to be explored in that because essentially we live in a, a capitalist world where it's all about incentivization. So you have, you know, you have, you have a tree, which is from evolution so infinitely complex in that it provides habitat, provides food for animals. It provides stability to the soil. So there's no surface runoff, which means, you know, water sources nearby are, are cleaner and fresher so there's more fish and other wildlife you know the values just go on forever and forever but the human attitude to this point because of incentivization um, means that that tree only has a value when it's cut down and turned into a piece of wood so you simplify something that's got this infinite complexity 
and you make it incredibly fragile when you make it a piece of wood. So yes, you could make a complex building out of it, but unlike a tree, it doesn't sell peel. Um, so it is that much more fragile. And I think that is something we really need to get into education is that evolution is like a constant movement towards complexity. What humans are doing to our natural environment is simplifying it and making it far more fragile. And there will be a point if we don't stop that it's so fragile, it becomes a snowball, com a snowball effect of collapse. So I really think it's a huge one about bringing morality and our understanding of nature. It's, I mean, it's, it's particularly hard for like a kid like myself uh, or anyone that's grown up in like a, in a major city where London is great because it's got lots of green spaces, but essentially we've created this false ecosystem and habitat. So it's very, you can be forgiven for not understanding humans' connection to nature. It's not, it's not just like a connection, it's we are tr intrinsically part of it. Every single thing you see around you comes from nature at some point in some source. Um, so I think it's really about that being a huge part of the education and kind of a lot of the rest of it will come. Um, if you start, yeah, if you change the morality minds of people, I think, you know, the rest becomes a little bit easier. That's really interesting you say that because the first question that we've had through from Sophia is, um, she says, I work in environmental psychology, which investigates the mindsets that are blocking environmental awareness and collective systemic change. What mindsets do you think are holding us back from this change? I mean, that's, that kind of connects what you're saying, Daisy, and what you're saying, though, about like, about the attitude which people have internally. But I guess pointing this a bit at, at Charlene, like thinking about mindsets, journalism, informing people, writing about issues. Like, do you think, what kind of mindsets do you think are holding back that change? Yeah, so I suppose the, the easy answer, the two word answer is a fixed mindset. And a lot of people sort of, um, you know, by narratives that are fed through you, through culture and through upbringing, um, and even through media, we have this very, um, small idea of what it means to be successful and what it means to be happy and unfortunately a lot of that more often than not is linked to things like consumerism it's linked to travel and it's linked to inherently unsustainable ways of living so I think that's that's the first thing we need to change is getting people into this sort of growth mindset where they are continuously learning and continuously open to change I think unfortunately we live in a world where more and more and this is actually partly because of those very social media bubbles that we were praising earlier that people are really resistant to changing opinion about things and I think that's where things like media and the arts and culture can really make a difference in terms of education and you know we can't just think of education as like school or uni or courses because inherently you're only going to engage with things that you are interested in so really I think we probably are in a stage now where we need to move beyond um preaching to the choir basically and talk to those who are not only apathetic but actually actively deniers of of climate change um, and I think that's going to be the real challenge and I think that's where where we're really struggling and we need folks like environmental psychologists actually to start to have those those very deep sort of behavioral and psychological evaluations of these folks and you know how do we push them to make make more sustainable um decisions um you know one field of research that i think is sort of invaluable to this going forward is behavioral economics and i think that is really going to have to be woven more and more into how we educate and how we communicate um, because it does allow for people to subtly be pushed towards making more sustainable decisions. Um, so I think absolutely, you know, I think for me, everything that we do is communication. Everything that we do is about activism. And, you know, from, you know, where you buy your coffee in the morning, right through to, you know, where you buy a book from at the end of, at the end of a day, it's quite literally everything is activism and, and everything is, is interlinked. Um, and I think when, once you see that, it's difficult to unsee that, that you are part of this system like Dave was saying earlier the system doesn't exist up here we are the system um, so I think it's reframing you know what actually is education um, and what do we want people to take away from this education as well um, and yeah like I say media arts culture have a way of communicating with people that um, that transcend you know those boundaries of formal learning I think thank you I was just, oh, sorry, I was just going to, just that we've just got a couple more questions to, to fire through. And actually, Daisy, I was wondering if, if this would be something that, because it's stuff that you've talked about in a lot of what 
what um, in the work you've done. Um, we've got two questions here which kind of connect to each other. And the first one is from Chad, which says that climate activist groups such as XR have a long history of marginalizing and ostracizing already oppressed groups such as indigenous people on the climate front line and the working class. This has led to the image that climate activism is white and middle class. What do you believe your groups and the groups you work with can do to decolonize your message and actions to ensure that those most affected and least heard are truly listened to and not marginalized? And then we've got another question here from Chris, which says, 58 year old activist here, still passionate. How do you make this for everyone? There's a danger we live in our bubble. Interesting to see climate change on the BBC drama, I Will Destroy You. And 25 years ago, helped out on a script to BBC Casualty about pollution. So thinking about, I guess that's like inclusivity and the, almost like the whitewashing of, of um, the climate movement, things like that. It's interesting to hear what, what mm. you think about that. Yeah, I would just say, um, just on that point of what education is, I think that's, that's where it comes from as well. I think that's still relevant to these questions. It's, it's re, like changing the way that we see education, understanding that we need to constantly be learning. And this kind of goes into the first point that Chad brought up. Um, I like how you say long history, because XR has actually been only operating for two years. Um, we are babies, <laughs> absolute babies in this field. Um, and this is why we mess up pretty often. <laughs> and I, I do think there is this space of, of being scared to get things wrong and being scared to put your hands up and say, we probably haven't done this the best way. And, and XR has kind of like, we, we've just done a recent apology about the way that we have been interacting with the police prior um, and, and people are starting to wake up and having this like real like moment of humanity to just explain that we don't get things right all the time. And also like, I think within that as well, it's, it's, it's being able to learn how to change the image and, and recognizing people. Like this panel alone can show you there is diversity. There are black people, ethnic minorities in the climate movement, give us our voices back. And I think that's, that's uh, something that's really, really touched upon me because I've had white people tell me what it's like to be a black person within XR. Um, and that's, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Uh, which, is, which is really annoying um, and it happens really often and and that is you oppressing me and oppressing my voice and my understanding of, of what it is like to be a black person in XR. Um, I do think that the environmental movement, especially in the UK, because I say in the UK because environmental activism has been from the indigenous people, have been from people all across the world and they are the OGs in this. We are just catching on now in the West. Um, people have been defending their land since, since colonization began, you know, so, th so that's something that we need to recognize as well. We need to recognize histories that have been suppressed um, and we need to really change this. Like I, I like, um, I was writing an article the other day and the editor picked out the title, which is called Ign Incognito Activism, um, because I was talking about the, the behaviors that we don't actually acknowledge as environmental activism. Like for example, in ethnic minority houses, especially like in like Nigerian or African, we have like um, conversations about like, when you go into the freezer, you're gonna find ice cream or jollof rice um, in like a plastic container because we tend to reuse a lot of stuff. And these are things that people don't recognize as an act of resilience against the system. Um, but you know, a bamboo, um, a bamboo or, or like a packaging or like a metal tin is what you see as an environmentalist. And it's about changing that mindset of not just saying, oh, it's white, it's middle class, but actually acknowledging the activism that's already happening. These communities are resilient because they've had to fight throughout their whole lives to be heard, to be seen. And I think we need to one, like sit back, especially like if you're white, you need to sit back and really hear these conversations and also like um, going on to the how to why people tend to not like how can we get people into the mind space of listening I was actually um, started reading this book called um, I think it's called Good Connections by uh, Dr. Julian uh, Holland and she basically talks about how when you basically tell someone that something that they may have done is wrong, suddenly, like even like within the body, they go into fight or flight. Um, so either they're like, I don't want to hear about it, I'm right, whatever, or they go, I'm going to argue to death, even if I don't even agree with what I'm arguing anymore. Um, and I think this is where we have to create this like really open space into listening to people and and within activism I, I can say like that space isn't created nearly often enough it's always blaming shaming cancel culture 
you do one thing wrong, you're out. Um, but we need to stop doing that because it doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help the minority communities. It doesn't help the space of activism either. What we need to do is start having these really difficult conversations and do it in a way of empathy because this system through things like media and culture, we have been influenced to almost see our visions of what like our everyday life as the world um, and not realize that there are other experiences within this world. So I think that's really important. It, it's really making sure that we have these spaces to have these really difficult conversation and we help hold it, but also bring our vulnerability into that. Brilliant. Um, thanks so much. There's, we've got another one here. Um, I think this would be good for you, Noga. It's um, sort of, it's, it feels like a question that needs a bit of hope. <laughs> this person, it says, um, is it not too late? Should the conversations not now shift to how to cope with the inevitable climate breakdown instead of being stuck on prevention? I think I, I think this is almost this is this is where it does get tricky because we essentially need to do both. Like if it's never too late. It's never too late. Like we if we don't do anything, we will just watch things getting worse and worse and worse. It's not that there's a cutoff point where it's like, okay, no more climate change, like that's it. Like we have to, we have to act. And um, you know, obviously we want we want action now, but we can't turn around in five years' time and be like nothing's happened. Let's just give up totally. We always have to keep uh, fighting, and what we really have to fight for uh, is is that mix of yes, protection for what is for the disasters that are already inevitable. You know, I th even in the UK, we we see. We had that heat wave last year. We see floods all the time. We see the effects of climate change kind of slowly creeping up on us, whereas in other places and parts of the world, of course, it's much more clear. And so we do need to, you know, start looking at um, at how, at the way in which we live, the spaces where we live, um, how we can protect livelihoods through a just transition as part of the Green New Deal, but how we can protect um, ourselves physically and and what that means for um, insulation, and what that means for for like, local economies, what that means for um, travel and cons and food consumption, um, and all of that is tied into preventing further stages of climate breakdown. And you know, any solution to climate change has to um, has to come at it with okay, prevention and protection. Otherwise, it, it's just not going to be enough. It's going to consistently leave people out of a out of a solution that is not the equitable future that we want. I think with the idea of of hope and whether it's and whether it's too late to act, whether we're afraid of of action. For me, it's it's never really been about hope. I think for so many people, it can almost be constricted to to say, okay, let's you know, let's let's hope that something good will happen. Let's be pessimistic in our messaging or let's be optimistic in our messaging and hope that will reach different demographics. Particularly in performing arts, we often say, okay, what's the best way we can relay a message of hope? I don't think that's the message we have to relay at all. I think we have to relay messages of action. I think we have to show what is going on all the time and only through, um, you know, only when we actually act, do we then have hope only you know, the, the more prepared we are to kind of beat down the, the cruelty and the criminality of the fossil fuel industry, only then do we actually gain hope as we go along. And it's it's never too late to, to try for that. Brilliant, thanks so much. Um, we're coming to the end now. Sorry that we didn't get around to all the questions, some really amazing questions there. Um, I just wanted to do one thing before we all go. In, if you have one sentence, one thing to say to someone that wanted to get involved in climate activism and didn't know how, what would you say just one at a time? Whoever wants to go. I know, sorry, you got to think about it for a second, but. <laughs> I would say just, just do it. Like, I, I think, as I talked before, there's this fear of getting things wrong, fear of being a hypocrite. But at this time, it's like, we actually just need to understand all of us are hypocrites. We're probably going to get a lot wrong, but we just need to get get things done and and as Rega said we we need to act and I do think it needs to come from this like really balanced place like in XR we call it love and rage it's a love of life and the life we're trying to save but also the rage and anger and disappointment in our systems and that like fire in us to make things happen and we need to really act from both places 
Yeah, I, I, I think it's, you know, this time shows the like, the age old thing that out of a crisis comes opportunity for change. So I think we're living in like a world that's already changing and it's about kind of jumping on that energy and having conversations with people. Like I've been having great conversations with Chris Hines who did Surfers Against Sewage. It's about speaking to people that are on side and people that are also not on side. And if you're just getting into it, start speaking to your friends about it. Start speaking about, you know, the roles you play, you know, how much meat do you consume? Do you consume like fast fashion? All, all these things that play a role. And then like one of the best things to do is start imagining what the future might look like. Like the Green New Deal thing is, is a beautiful thing because it is actually bringing loads of new jobs and new energy systems and a whole new way of living that might not just be good for the environment, but good for our mental health and good for the health of everything in society. So, you know, there is an aspect to it that can be really fun. And I would start with conversations. I think mine is sort of similar to that. And I think I would just say mentoring is really, really powerful in this situation. I think nobody that I've met who is actively involved in, in the climate crisis, um, you know, whether that's other journalists or activists or artists or anyone, nobody comes at this half ass like, you could ask any of the four people here or, you know, anybody, you know, who's interested and they would talk at you about it for hours. It is just, it's a mind boggling subject in and of itself, but we just love talking about it and love communicating about it. So I think if you are in a position where you want to learn more, I think don't be afraid to reach out to somebody who you look up to, who is doing work in that space already and, and ask them for guidance. Please don't be afraid to do that. I think, yeah, I mean, for me, the mo the two most important things are really um, sorry. <laughs> for me, the the two most important things are for for young people my age. You have to, I think, in days touched on this. You have to fall in love with the world around you. You have to fall in love with the people around you if you want to gain that kind of powerful empathy. You have to um, you have to recognize the value and dignity that every single person is worth and deserving of and in recognizing yourself and everyone else as an equal worthy of that love and of that dignity you then reach a stage where you realize that you don't have to ask for permission or defer to anyone else in order to make the change that you want to see you know there's no one that you have to go to to say is it okay if I tear this system down like you you have to take that step and go I I have the right to act on on what is right and what is morally crucial and what at this time is the most important challenge we are facing. And, and I think there is something beautifully empowering in that. Oh, brilliant. Thanks everyone. That was such a fantastic debate, honestly. Um, that's all we've got time for. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, please do listen to the new audio drama As Waters Rise, which was commissioned by the Almeida written by Ben Weatherall, directed by Alex Brown, and performed by members of the Almeida's Young Company, which is on the Almeida's SoundCloud channel and website. Um, you can also join us for our next event, which is Art Matters, which is a showcasing discussion of visual art created by young activists in response to the climate crisis, and that's at 4 p.m. today, so that's about half an hour. Um, and there's also more resources, recommendations, artworks, films, all available on the Shifting Tides area of the Almeida website, so please do give it a look. Thanks so much. <laughs>